started, we're up to about a hundred, but the other half will be coming in late, probably. Um, so today we are going to talk about the new Pukyo property in the Colca Canyon, Colca Valley of Peru. Um, just to give a little bit of background here um, in terms of where this property fits in, who manages it, who runs it, for those that are unfamiliar. Um, I've known Ignacio Macias for, oof, I was trying to think this morning, probably 20, 25 years when I used to live in Peru, met him when he, he's the son-in-law of um, Jose Kecklin, and he used to be the managing director of Inca Terra before going out on his own. Um, so Ignacio has been involved with Inca Terra for years. When he left Inca Terra, he was involved in the creation of Hotel B, and then kind of did his own thing with hotels, built Tidilaca on Lake Titicaca, um, did Cerca and Arequipa, which we're going to talk about today. He also has two hotels in Lima, a Temporal, and Fausto, which are small little properties. I don't officially represent them, but check them out if you've never heard of them. Um, you know, for me, Ignacio, his greatest strength is that he kind of sees destinations that are really underappreciated and undervalued. You know, you're, we obviously have mass tourism that goes to Cusco, Sacred Valley, Machu Picchu area, but Peru has so much to offer um, visitors. And Ignacio has been really good at seeing not just trends and travelers, but destinations that really need something cool and saying, look, you know, a lot of people go to Lake Titicaca, but there's nothing of quality there that really, you know, matches the destination. So he built Titilaca. He looked at, you know, Lima, everyone was concentrated in the Miraflores area, and he was involved in seeing that Barranco was the cool up and coming neighborhood and did Hotel B there. Now there's a lot of, you know, people going to the Barranco area. Um, Cerca, same thing. Arequipa, such an amazing place. Not many people or travelers are going to. There wasn't a luxury hotel there. So did Cerca, unfortunately, open that right before the pandemic started. And then he has these two properties in Lima, which again, I said, I don't officially represent them. But his idea there was that you have so many big hotels throughout Lima, but he wanted to do these really small hotels that, you know, are six, seven rooms that really feel like you're staying as a guest in someone's house, he calls them hotelitos. So they're really cool. Um, part of their um, business, as well as Peru Empire, it's a, a on-site, a virtuous on-site in DMC in Peru. And again, you know, I don't uh, represent uh, DMCs, but just wanted to put that out there that this is part of, of what they do. Um, you're going to be meeting Lorenzo Macias, which is his son. Lorenzo also studied at Cornell along with his father, and most of his families all went to Cornell. And uh, he's back working full-time with his fathers now, so it's really cool to see kind of the torch being passed on. Ignacio was a huge mentor to me, and he's obviously a great mentor to his son, Lorenzo, who's doing a great job. So you're going to be, uh, you know, communicating a lot more with, with Lorenzo and seeing him at shows and, and trade shows and the like. So where Pukio kind of fits in, as I said in my initial email sending this out, was that, you know, Titilaca was built back in, I think, 2008. Um, but Ignacio always had this idea of doing this southern route that kind of connected Lake Titicaca with Circa stopping off in the Colca Canyon because it makes a wonderful route. Um, so he did Tidilaca and then he started, then he, he opened up Sirica right before the pandemic. So like 2019, and then just finished with Pukio in the Sacred Valley. So these three properties kind of, you know, can be visited individually, but they make this incredible journey. And that's what I'm going to kind of base this presentation on today is doing a journey from Sirica to the Colca Valley in Pukio and then finishing in Tidilaca, but mostly focusing on Pukio because it's new. I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with the other properties. So this is just kind of an overview of the route. And we're just going to talk initially about some transfer times. Um, you can see at the bottom how I kind of suggest doing two or three nights in Arequipa at Sitica, two or three nights in Coca Valley at Pukio, two or three nights in Lake Titicaca. Um, you can do this either or. You can start at Lake Titicaca and finish in Sitica, um, but it kind of works better this way just due to altitude. So Sitica into the Coca Canyon is about a three-hour drive, um, and then for when you're in the Coca Canyon to carry on to Lake Titicaca is about a, a six-hour drive. Um, one thing that I realized I didn't put in this presentation, but I should have, is that you also have the Ant the Belmont Andean Explorer train, which does Cusco to Lake Titicaca and then carries on to Arequipa. They do that once a week. I think it leaves Cusco on Thursday, gets to Lake Titicaca. They spend Friday there. And then on Saturday, they go to Arequipa. You can actually, on that train journey, get off that train, uh, I think around 1130 in the morning at a stop called Canyawas. And from there, it's about an hour and a half drive into the Colca Valley. So that's one way to do it as well. Um, the reason why I say it works best doing this starting in Arequipa is just if we look at the altitude of these different destinations, you know, Lima is obviously at sea level. Then when you get to Arequipa, Arequipa is a wonderful place to acclimate because of its altitude around seven and a half thousand feet. 
And then getting into Colca Canyon, Colca itself, where the property is, you're around 11,200 feet. You do have a high pass to get to on the way there. And then once you spend some time in the Colca Canyon, you'll continue and finish at the highest point at Lake Titicaca. So this is why this journey works best in this manner. I mean, obviously, if people are coming from Cusco, then going up to Lake Titicaca, they're going to be acclimated and they can do this in reverse. But as far as like starting a trip, this is the way that you would want to do it. So kind of the closest air access to get to the Colca Canyon, the Colca Valley is the Arequipa Airport. Um, Arequipa is Peru's second largest city behind Lima. Um, it's got, I think, about a million and a half people. Um, and there's daily flights almost every hour from sunup to sundown going between Lima and Arequipa. Um, that flight's only an hour and a half, so it works really well. Even if people are landing like super early in the morning in Lima, they can go and connect with a flight um, to get to Arequipa on the same day without having to overnight in Lima. Um, but pretty much, like I said, you have a flight almost every hour, if not every half an hour, leaving from Lima to Arequipa. It's a very accessible city. There also is one, um, there's there's two daily flights going between Cusco and Arequipa. So if people are doing Cusco, Sacred Valley, Machu Picchu area, and they want to come down and start this journey this way, they can connect with those flights. Or say they're coming into Arequipa, just going to the Colca, returning to Arequipa, then they can continue on their trip flying to Cusco rather than doing this overland route to Lake Titicaca. Um, there is uh, an airline called JetSmart that does a flight two, twice a week from Santiago de Chile as well. So people are doing a Chile trip combined with Peru. This is another option that you can combine this in there. So I'm not going to dive a whole lot into Cerca. I'll do a separate webinar on that. But since this is kind of the gateway to get to the Coca, I want to talk about it initially. So this is the Plaza de Armas in Arequipa. Lovely, lovely city. It's very European. It has some of the best weather of anywhere um, in Peru. They have like 360 degrees of sunshine a year. You know, the temperatures are in the mid 70s almost every day. You're surrounded by these volcanoes. It's you're kind of on the northern reaches of the Atacama Desert. That's why the weather is so nice here. Um, this is this property, Cerca, which is there. This is an old uh, monastery that they converted into an 11 room boutique hotel. And this is I mean, to me, I think this is one of the most beautifully, uh, aesthetically, architecturally designed hotels that I've ever been to, just keeping the tradition of this old monastery, this white volcanic CR stone, um, the light that filters through here during the day is incredible. So flying in here, this is a really good place to kind of ease into a Peru trip because you have, it's great for acclimating at that altitude of around seven and a half thousand feet, beautiful weather, and it's a lovely city to explore. So this is just one of the 11 suites there at Cerca. And you've got, you know, this is not, it's, as I said, it's a nice way to ease into a trip. You've got beautiful architecture there. You can visit, you know, the different like Santa Catalina Monastery, this picture on the right, all the markets in downtown Arequipa, um, visit some of the stone quarries outside of town, which is fascinating. So um, people heading to the Colca Canyon, one, you don't want to miss Arequipa. It's definitely worth a stop. And secondly, it's really valuable to spend two nights here just for the acclimatization before going on to the Colca Canyon. Um, so after you've been in Arequipa, based at Cerca, you're going to head out to the Colca Canyon. So it's about a three-hour drive directly. Generally, it takes people around four hours because there's a lot of stops along the way and people want to stop and take pictures and use the bathroom and et cetera, et cetera. But you're essentially leaving Arequipa and you're driving up around um, the volcano Mismi and Chachani, which we're looking at here from Arequipa, until you're on the backside of these volcanoes going across these kind of high um, altiplano plains. It's a fascinating, fascinating drive. You know, um, that's three hours go by pretty quick because the, the scenery is constantly changing. Um, you're kind of going over high areas with all of the herds of alpaca and llama and um, the bacuna that are up here. And this is a very high pass. So it's one of the highest road passes in Peru. You actually pass over exactly 16,000 feet at a place called Pata Pampa. Um, so again, that's why I said you really want to acclimate a couple days in Arequipa before doing this journey because this is very high. Um, but it's a really cool experience. And actually, when you get up here, I mean, this I looked for so many pictures that I had of Pata Pampa, but it's so hard to capture this place. I mean, you figure this is just one screenshot, but you're not looking at the full panorama or 360 up here. But you're actually, when you get up here, you have a full view of kind of the continental divide of the Andes looking at the, you know, we're on the, the western side of the watershed here. Those peaks there on Pato and, and Sabancay on the other side of those, all the water is flowing down into the Amazon. And from here, you actually do see um, Mismi, which is actually the, the source of the Amazon River. So it's the furthest bit of water droplets that are going into the Amazon basin. So this is a fascinating pass to go over. And then from there, you're just descending down into the Colca Canyon. Um, you'll hear it be called Colca Canyon and be called Colca Valley because it's a very long gorge. Um, kind of the valley is where the hotel is and more of the inhabited areas of the valley. And then as you go downstream a little bit, you get down to the canyon portion of it. So 
The Colca Canyon is one of the deepest river canyons in the world. It's the, the third deepest officially river canyon in the world. I think the first two, the one is like the Sangpo in, in China. And then there's another one in Nepal that are that are deeper than the Colca. But in the deepest parts of the Colca, you're looking at 11,200 feet, basically, from the highest mountains down into the very bottom of the gorge. So it's a spectacle to behold. Um, this picture, as you see down on the right, those kind of uh, circular things, this is actually a viewing platform at Cruz del Condor, which I'll talk about later. Um, where people go to see the condor soar in this portion of the canyon. But so you're coming in this incredible geological wonder. But the thing that really makes, you know, the Colca Canyon so unique are the cultures um, that have inhabited this valley for at least over 2000 years. It's been lived in and farmed there. Um, you kind of have two main ethnic groups that live in the Colca Canyon, which are super fascinating. You have the Coyagua people, which are there on the left. And then you have the Cabana people, which is this woman's dress on the right. And traditionally, the Coyaguas lived in kind of the upper valley portions, kind of near where the hotel is, area of the, of the valley. And the Cabanas were in the south and they were very um, separated. The Coyaguas speak Ayamara, which is a more of a, a language coming from Bolivia and from the high altiplano. And then the Cabana speak Quechua um, languages. So, and those languages actually come from completely di different linguistic groups. They don't, there's no similarities in them, which is really bizarre that these people have co-inhabited this valley for over 2000 years and don't speak the same language. Um, I mean, now obviously Spanish is the the what, what they'll use to communicate with each other, but two different languages, very different dress. And, you know, this is part of the Colca Valley, as I'll talk about when we get into the excursions. It's not just going through this incredible landscape, but it's really like learning from the people here. These people, yeah, they were part of the Incan Empire for like a blip in their timeline when the Incas subjugated them into the empire. But they've lived here for 2000 years and have their own, you know, customs and traditions. Um, the dress is really interesting. Actually, the people, the the. Coyaguas, now they wear these kind of these white paper mache hats, which are flat um, on the top. Um, and then the cabanas have these kind of dome shaped felt hats that are heavily embroidered. And actually, here's another picture. Um, interesting that back in the day, the Coyagua people, as you see this woman here on the left who's spinning wool, if you look at the top of her flat hat, you see that little ridge that's on there. They used to, before the Spanish arrived, um, do like cranial deformation and would have kind of cylindrical cone skulls, which was in reference to their the volcano above their main village. Um, this was obviously outlawed by the Spanish, but they still, when they when they switched to this more kind of Western style dress, they still have that ridge in the top of their hat talking about the ancestry. And actually the Cabana people with these domed, they used to do this the different uh, cranial deformation and have more of domed skulls. And so their hats kind of are paying tribute to that that thing. But the dress is beautiful. And most of this dress, actually, um, what's interesting is that these these long dresses, and you'll see the women in the fields, they'll pin them up and and fill it with crops. This actually comes from the Extremadura area of Spain. That was the conquistador, the Spanish conquistadors that came initially into the, the valley in the 16th century. Um, they brought in this, this style of clothing, which the women still wear today, which is, uh, you know, associated with that southern area of Spain. Um, but as I said, you have this incredible gorge with this long history of these two ethnic groups in the valley, and they have terraced this valley unbelievably. And, you know, you see terracing around the Sacred Valley and other areas of Peru, but you never see such extensive, beautiful terracing as you do in the Colca. So for me, it's a combination of this incredible geological wonder of the gorge, this very pristine um, two ethnic groups there that are thriving in their in their cultures and traditions. And then you have them, you know, working the fields and these beautiful, beautiful terraces that they've farmed for 2000 years. It's just a fascinating place. So this kind of brings it all together, showing the geological wonder of the gorge, the terracing, and then the, the local people inhabiting it. So I got a little sidetrack there on a little history lesson <laughs> about, about the valley. Um, but you know, that's the, the stuff I love and that's why I love the Colca, Colca Valley. Um, but we're going to dive into the Hotel Pukio. So um, this is just a shot to kind of show where it's situated. Those that have been in the Colca canyon before just to situate it if to the right my right looking at this screen down there around the corner would be where the Colca Lodge is down by the river and then to the left maybe another five or six miles is where Las Casitas del Colca would be so Pukio is just outside the village of Yanque kind of in between where the Colca Lodge is and Las Casitas del Colca um, this is out in the countryside you're right on the edge of the gorge where this property is it's a very very small property so this is actually a drone shot I took just showing um, the whole property in its entirety. And we're going to kind of walk through it bit by bit. So this is the main lodge area, um, which we're going to go into first to have a look at. 
So this is obviously the main gathering area, the lounge. This is where all the meals are served as well. It's a small space because this is a small property. We only have eight rooms. It's a very, very intimate property. Um, there's a nice little wood burning stove with some chairs with the view out over the, the canyon. There's a lot of decking around the main lodge. And, you know, this just opened. There's still things that they have not finished there. Like they're going to do a hot tub or jacuzzi, like a thermal bath there on one of the patios, which hasn't been finished yet. There's a yoga deck, stuff like that. We don't have pictures of it because they're still in the process of finishing it. The property's so new. Um, but here, just a couple shots of, you know, the service and kind of the atmosphere inside the main lodge area. It's actually Ignacio's sister, Sandra, who does the design. Actually, Sandra and her mother that have done the design for this property and all the properties and the Inca Terra property. So you'll kind of see that DNA in these properties and the, and the design elements. And um, I don't know, I'm always just have great appreciation for people that have this ability to uh, pull together such incredible interior design aesthetics. As far as the meals, what they do there, um, you know, the other properties that they have are Relais Chateau and it's kind of, you know, more um, fancy dining. Here in Pukio, they're really focusing on like local, local flavors and using local cooking techniques, which is a lot of open fire and flame. So I would say the majority of the stuff that cook there, they use the, the wood oven outside to do it. So you get all of these kind of charred, burnt things, you know, crops that are pulled straight out of the earth, a very simple fare. And they're trying to really emulate what people, you know, what's grown around you in the valley that you're eating. So like farm to plate in a sense, but keep it very, you know, um, true to, to the local diet of the people there. Um, it's more kind of family style dining. So they will have um, like each meal is kind of set. So this is like everybody gets served the same thing. And it's generally in big platters and people grab what they want. And then they do have a separate menu of just like a la carte stuff. That people are saying, I don't really feel like eating that today. I want a bowl of pasta. Fine, they can do that. But the the kind of the gastronomic experience here is very local and not just in products, but also in kind of cooking styles of it as well. So you see the steak, potatoes, fresh vegetables, quinoa, um, here. Someone was just asking about location. Is it on the opposite side of the valley to Casitas del Coca? No, this is, it's the opposite side of the valley from the Coca Lodge. So the Coca Lodge is actually across. Um, We're on the same side of the valley as Casitas del Coca, but a bit closer to the village of Yanque than they are, Michelle. And here's just a shot of the, of the view at night. Actually, if you see behind the lodge here, those lights off in the distance, kind of behind the property down there, it was where Casitas del Coca would be located. Um, so that was the main lodge. Um, and as you can see, actually in this picture, see all these, these patios here and particularly this one. And there is this bath here. This is where they're going to be developing more of like yoga decks and a hot tub and jacuzzi for it. But we're going to dive in and look at the room. So super small property. You see, this is just eight rooms. A thing I love about this as well is even just the, the, the gardens around this rather than, you know, rather than do landscaping here to make it like all fancy. I mean, basically the landscaping there, they still, they grow, they grow crops there that are used in the kitchen. So when you're walking to your tent or your, to your room, you're passing through fields of quinoa, through corn, haba beans, whatever they're growing there and rotating. So kind of the landscaping is always going to change because it's an active, active farming plots around the property. Um, so with the eight rooms, which cool, I mean, this is a tented property, but it's not, it's only half a tented property. So we have four pertica rooms. And then we have four tents. So that's how it is. There's eight rooms, half are tented, half are non-tented accommodation. So we're first going to have a look at the tent so you can get a style of what they're like and what they offer here. Um, so there's basically two of the tents are carpas and two are called carpa refugios. I'm going to show you the difference in those. We're going to go into just the normal carpas mostly just so you get a sense of it. Um, these tents, they actually designed themselves. They didn't buy these off the shelf from someone. You know, the 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 temperatures and everything in, in the valley you have a lot of temperature swings very cold at night very warm during the day um, they spent years actually doing this in lima um, kind of experimenting with different materials and fabrics and came up with their own construction of these tents and they did a really good job if they wanted to start a business just doing clamping tents they could do that um, so this is going into one of the carpas these as i said what were they they're 600 square feet um, in the two of the the standard carpas so this is the um, the main interior. You can see those kind of cool safari wardrobes in the back. Um, these can be either twin or king bedded. Um, it is a tent. So I mean, when you feel the walls, it's kind of double sided with insulation between them. Um, there are uh, double paned windows in there, which can be opened. Um, what I noticed there in particular, having stayed in a lot of tented camps, they did a really good job here of and kind of the weatherproofing of it. 
Um, I, I was down here in early December. So this, that's their summer or their, you know, the warmer time of year. Um, I love a fire at night. So this is actually looking from the bed, looking out at the views of it. But um, I was really interested, you know, how cold these could potentially be in the, in the colder part of the high season, like June, July, August, when it gets colder there. And uh, one night I, I turned this on and I ended up having to sleep with every single window open in the tent. It got so warm in there. And it's not just the wood burning stove. There's actually behind these, uh, behind this white fabric here, there's like ceramic um, radiators as well, which can be turned on and they have a movable one as well. And you get those things going and the fire, I mean, I couldn't imagine here, even in the, the coldest nights of the year, these tents are very, very toasty. But at the same time, when it is warm, there's plenty of circulation. You can open up all of these windows. There's the high window up above the bed as well, which uh, can kind of let any trapped air escape. But just beautifully, beautifully done, the design aesthetics um, of these tents. So this is the carpa um, and the bathroom. So the bathroom is the portion that kind of isn't tented. You know, these are more... Um, there is fabric on them, but it's a it's a hard shell structure just because of the piping and stuff. Um, is this peeking through? And actually, I don't have great pictures of the bathrooms, but you can see in this in the vertical to the right, looking in, it has actually a cool indoor outdoor shower. So you can be in this, but you there's a sliding glass door open, and then there's a shower on the outside as well. People that want to have an outdoor shower, these all do have baths as well, but the baths are outdoors and they're not super private. So I would say people, if you have travelers that are really like love to have a bath every day. I mean, I'm not a bath person. I love outdoor showers. I would go for the tents because one, I love tented accommodations. I love sleeping and listening to the birds waking me up in the morning. Um, I'm not a bath person, but the baths there, you kind of have to wear like, you know, a bathing bathing suit or swimming costume to use the bath because they're exposed to people outside. So that's just one thing to know about. Let me just check on questions here. Um, I'll get into that. Um, yeah, all the windows have screens on them as well. Actually, no, they don't at the moment saying that that's a good question, but I think that they probably would be installing screens on that. Um, so we had the normal carpas that we just looked at. And then the other two tents are called Car carpa refugios. I'm not going to go super deep into these because they're very similar to the other tents in terms of what they offer. It's more just that these have, um, as you can see here, the layout is, has a bit more square footage, how much more square footage. So it's got 50 more square feet than the regular carpa tents. Um, but they did these, the additional, as you can see back here, this little sofa that can be made up into an additional bed. So the the two standard carpas can only sleep two people. You can't put an additional bed in there. The maximum occupancy is two. The carpa refugios with this additional 50 square feet, they have this, this, this additional bed in there. So you can you know sleep three people in there. So you can do it as a king with the additional bed, or you can do twins with the additional bed for that. And it's just more of a kind of, um, horizontal layout of the furniture in the tent rather than, you know, along the, the length access of it. So that is the Carpa Refugio. So those are the tents, the four tents. Um, actually, this is the Carpa Refugio, this is the Carpa Refugio, and these are the two standard Carpas here. And then we're going to dip into what are they called the Perica room. So this is the non-tented accommodation there for people that are just not into tents. Again, really cool design. Um, each of these buildings has two rooms in it. So the rooms, um, the way this works out is that when you enter through this kind of vestibule mud area, that can be, these doors can be left open. So this can make one family unit with two rooms combined, or those can be closed off and they can be individual rooms. So that was kind of the, the thinking here is that if you do have families traveling together, booking the two Perica rooms in the same unit, they have a, a two bedroom um, layout. Um, so um, this is the Perica rooms. Um, so kind of the same design style as the tents, but just not tented. This is a, an adobe structure. Um, this as well, like I said, if you're really into baths, these have the interior bathtub. So you'd want to go with this. Um, these don't have an outdoor shower. The shower is indoors. It's actually kind of behind the headboard here um, of the bed. Um, again, it's a couple shots of the interior and of the bath and the Perica rooms. Um, the one thing I'd say one of the biggest benefits to the Pitaka rooms as well is that since they're located right on the edge of the canyon, as you can see this picture to the left, this is your views looking out of your windows and from the terrace here. Um, most of the tents, except for the far one, is right on the edge of the canyon. The other ones are set back a little bit, so you're not sitting there on the terrace with this view looking down onto the river. Um, so these have that advantage of having this beautiful terrace looking down into the canyon. So that was about the accommodations. 
Um, Someone's asking if the client is comfortable with it. Is a bathing suit required to take a bath or is it just recommended? Well, it would really depend if they're um, <laughs> how comfortable they are because literally the bathtubs at the tents are out and people might be walking by to the room and you're right there. So if you don't mind uh, being naked in front of strangers, then go for it. But I would definitely say you would want to wear a bathing suit going in the, the baths and the, at the tents at the moment. Um, so moving on to excursions. This is still something that Lorenzo and his dad Ignacio and the team are working on to finding like exact routes and everything. But um, I want to give you just kind of an overview of the excursions. And at the end, I'm going to send you the actual, you know, detailed excursion book. I don't want to spend all the time going through every different excursion. But for me, the essence of the Colca is one is that this, you know, one hundredth the amount of visitors are visiting the Colca Valley as compared to, say, the Sacred Valley outside of Cusco. So you're in this huge canyon and valley with walks and trails everywhere through these beautiful fields and you don't see anybody. So it's less of a place that you're really going to visit like specific points of interest in the valley rather than, hey, let's go for a walk. How long do you wanna walk? Do you wanna walk for 30 minutes, an hour? Do you wanna do a half day? Do you wanna do a full day walk? And then there's all these beautiful routes along river courses and through different villages. There's a lot of pre-Incan ruins there like Uyo Uyo, which you can visit. And the guides there just make up all these beautiful routes where you're just going through the countryside, stopping and talking with people along the way. Um, again, going back to this picture. So, you know, there are trails everywhere and you can walk across around here, come down this. Uh, it's almost like every walk can be a new exploration as far as, um, you know, doing something new. We do have a few routes that people are walking, but it's this vast area just to go and explore with your guide. Um, this is an example of here. You can see some of the pre-Incan ruins here. I think this is called San Lorenzo or something, but there was a walk from the village here that you can see the path coming up through here. There was actually burial chambers up here, which we explored where they're full of skulls and bones and offerings and everything, and then carried on and walked down across the river Canyon up into a village, stopped and drank some beer. So it's just like, it's right for exploration. This is what's really going to attract people here is people that want to get out and be active and not see a bunch of other tourists and explore the countryside. But as you're exploring the countryside, the people are there farming and it's wonderful to speak with them. I mean, when I was there, I had this one conversation with a local guy that I thought was cruelly interesting. He was like, so you're a tourist. Where are you from? I'm from California. Da -da. And he asked me and I just love he asked this question. He says, what is it that makes a foreigner like you want to come here to the Colca? Like, what is the attraction? And I kind of thought about it. And I was like, you know what? To be honest, it's like talking with you as you're out here farming haba beans in this beautiful valley and you're opening up, you know, the irrigation channel, moving a stone and moving the water through your field, doing everything by hand. I said, it's just lovely for someone like me who lives in San Francisco and goes to the supermarket and buys all their food, which is in cellophane packaging. It's there's something wonderful about being here in this, you know, gorgeous gorge, people in their traditional dress, having their hands in the dirt producing this bounty of food. I said, for me, that's really fascinating because that's not something, you know, I see often where I live. Like I just go to the supermarket and buy stuff. I don't have a connection with the earth like you do. So it's really seeing you all's connection with the earth and your traditions. And he was like, interesting, you know, like it was the last thing he would think of because that's their, their everyday life. But I think that's what's so cool about the Colca is that's this area that there's so few visitors that you can just go out in these walks and interact with local people. And that's what you're there for is what I just described. Um, obviously the way that, you know, Andy and runs these hotels, they do incredible picnics surprises on long different routes. So this is just an example of some of the picnic service, um, outdoors during any of the excursions that you're doing. Um, as I said before, one of the biggest attractions, which does draw people to the Coca Canyon is this is arguably the best place in South America to see the Andean condor soar in the wild, um, down it's about an hour or something drive from Pukio property down to where you get to the Cruz del Condor. It can be a little bit of a shock because that is the area where there are a lot of tourists that go there. They actually even do day trips from Arequipa, like backpackers, where they leave at four o'clock in the morning, drive all the way to the Colca to be there around 10 a.m. when the thermals begin in the valley to see it. So you do see a lot of people when you go down to the to the Cruz del Condor, but it's worth it. I mean, you can be there. You can see three or four condors. You can see 12 or 20 soaring around. So, you know, um, I'd say apart from maybe Hacienda Zuleta in Ecuador, there's no other place I've been that has this um, access to seeing the condors soar. Um, it's kind of a guaranteed thing when you go down there. And as we're working on the operations here at Pukio, we are finding other areas of the canyon where we're going to be starting to take people so they're not kind of exposed to the mass tourism that you see at Cruz del Condor. 
So that's a work in progress of finding other areas which have really good condor spotting, which are going to be more private in a way. But it is um, seeing the having these things soar over your head or at eye level um, where you can actually hear the whoosh of the wind as they soar over. You know, they can have wingspans of 13 feet is something to behold. And you have to go see this if you're down in the Kolka. So beyond that, um, the Kolka is also um, really rich in like geothermal activity. Um, it's known for a lot of hot springs. Um, unfortunately at Pukio, they don't have their own hot springs yet. That's one thing they're working on is that there's hot springs down below in the valley. There's a public hot springs that we currently take guests to, but you know, it's a public, uh, you know, uh, hot spring. So you're there with the local people, which some people can find fascinating. Others might go and just be like, oh, this isn't, you know, up to luxury standards. We're working on that, uh, finding a way to bring in some hot water piping into our own hot tubs there on the property. But this is one other place that I, you know, I've been going to the Colca Canyon for 20 years and I had never gone out to these um, geysers. This blew my mind. It's kind of a off the beaten path, a dirt road to get up to these geysers, but it's an area along this creek right below this massive volcano where, I mean, it's like Yellowstone. I mean, the hissing of this geyser, when you are within 500 yards of it, you can't speak to someone. You have to yell into their ear. The loud, It's so loud, the hissing of the steam um, that's shooting out of the earth here. It's it's phenomenal. You can feel it in your chest um, and nearby there's all these hot water things where they'll drop food in to boil like hard boiled eggs and stuff. The guides will do that for you. But that's something amazing, which I didn't know existed in the, the valley and they're still finding other sites um, for excursions. And then the other thing is just going and kind of diving into the, the cultural history of this of the valley. So all of these towns have beautiful churches, beautiful courtyards, um, really ornate structures. And the history is really fascinating, as I talked about with the Cabanas and the Coyaguas. Prior to the Spanish arriving, they were not allowed to intermarry between the two tribes. It was completely separated. Um, you know, again, with the language difficulties, the Spanish came in and kind of restructured the valley and put you know, town centers and both these little townships to bring everybody together. Now the Cobanes and the Coyagos are, you know, they intermarry and they're, they, they live together quite well, but just the whole historical um, story of, of the valley uh, from the Spanish arriving and all of the tales you hear from the people and the traditions here are amazing. Um, there's just a woman in one of the, the valleys just to see the, the beauty of that embroidery on her petticoats is phenomenal. Um, and there's, it's also an area you have a lot of folklore. So we do actually have like a folklore calendar of like when certain patron saints of the different villages are be celebrating. So if you can plan a trip around when one of these festivals is happening in the town, it's incredible. So going into these churches is really cool where you see the kind of synthesis of the ancient traditions of the people mixed with Catholicism in the churches. Um, this is actually a boy here on the left. One of the most famous dances there is called the Wat Watiti dance, um, which is actually the tale of when the first ever like intermarriage happened between the Cabanas and the Coyagas. It's kind of a uh, Romeo and Juliet story of a boy dressing up as a girl to go, you know, court someone from the other ethnic group. Um, that I think happens in February is when that main dance is. I was there in December and we caught one of the festivals in a town and it was, it was phenomenal. We were there all evening dancing with the people. Um, and then they do a lot of stuff. They do like a medicinal plant walk, um, going through with the local guides, kind of pulling up different herbs and stuff out of the earth to understand what the local people use for it. This is also a Pacha, uh, Pachamanca experience, which the chef can do at, um, Pukio, which is a traditional, um, they basically heat up hot rocks, put them in the earth and then put layers of vegetables and meats and everything in the earth and cover it up and leave it for hours, kind of an earthen oven. And then it's, it's dug up and you feast from what's in there. So an example of some of the excursions there. Um, so that was the kind of overview of, of what excursions would be like staying in Pukio and what the valley offers from kind of a geography and a cultural perspective. I'm just going to show you briefly what the opening season rates, which we have here. Um, so let's just say here's regular season, not in high season, 660 per person in a double. So you're looking at, you know, $1,300 for a couple. Um, but that is also including transfers from either Lake Titicaca or from Arequipa to get there and then shared full half or quarter day excursions. All the meals, all alcoholic beverages are included in that. Um, we do have additional price if you want all private touring that can be done as an additional, but I think that, you know, the value for money for what you're getting here is, is amazing. Let me just review real quick. What, um, yeah, I'm sending a recording, Susan, don't worry. Um, yeah, it is full board and activities, which we're talking about, um, bones and caves. Yeah. I didn't put those pictures in there out of respect, but, um, 
So no, they, one good question that they use their own guides. We do have our own on-house, uh, you know, on-staff guides. You can book this through any of your DMCs. And obviously if they have like a tour uh, leader who is coming along um, that does work where they'll often they'll have like that tour leader stay in the town of Yonke in a hotel and then take the guides touring. So however you want to set that up, if you want to have, you know, use our own guides or you're working through a DMC that that works out as well. So um, let's carry on and just finish at Titi Laka so you understand how this would work. So if people were starting in Arequipa and then they went to the Colca Canyon and then wanted to carry on to Lake Titicaca to complete this kind of trifecta of the properties, it is a six hour drive to get to Lake Titicaca or to Titi Laka from Pukyo, but a fascinating drive. And I think this is, again, the type of travelers is going to be attracted to are people that maybe been to Peru before they've done the Cusco, Sacred Valley, Machu Picchu area, and they want to come back to Peru and go someplace that's less known and less visited and not see a bunch of tourists and really dive into like, a, you know, a rural authentic area. This is where you're going. So this drive, as you come back out of the, the valley, you're literally what I always feel like you're driving across the roof of the world. I mean, massive, massive skies, huge volcanoes and huge, huge areas of, um, of pasture where they're raising all the different uh, camelids. And you, this drive actually takes you right through uh, one of the largest actually national reserves in Peru, which is called the Salina y Guadalblanca Reserve. And so these are high altitude lagoons and salt flats surrounded by volcanoes. So this is a very similar area to maybe like, you know, parts of Northwestern Argentina or um, Northeast Chile, like the Atacama Desert, as you drive that area, you're just on the roof of the world at really high altitude where you have these gatherings of water and these salt flats. And here's a beautiful picture of, you know, a dried up lake bed with salt flats with a vicuña roaming. Here's another lagoon full of flamingo. And this just kind of blows people's mind, you know, getting this picture of like, where was this taken? And you're like, oh, that, this was at 14,000 feet in the Andes. It's not, people are generally not expecting to find pink flamingos. I mean, you're expecting to like find those when you go play like High Lie in, in Miami or something, but to find them in the middle of the Andes is really mind blowing. Um, and this is the area that's like the real traditional area where all of the alpaca and vicuña fibers um, from most of the mills, which are based in Arequipa, this is where it all comes from. So you're driving through this area and just sees these vast, vast herds of camelid and the local people that are out shepherding. So we'll stop along the way and talk to the people, which is really cool um, until you get to Lake Titicaca. Um, and again, quite high. So 12 and a half thousand feet when you get to the lake, this is actually looking over towards the Cordillera Real in Bolivia. Um, but what a place to end this overland journey to get to Lake Titicaca to Titilaca Lodge, which personally one of my favorite properties and I think favorite property for a lot of people that have been there. I mean, just the colors, the intensity of the colors, the traditions and just the beauty of this hotel is unparalleled. So just gonna show a couple pictures to refresh what a cool place this is. Um, you know, and I think that out of the properties to kind of finish here is really, uh, I don't know, it's just overwhelming um, to see that particularly you've been in kind of arid areas and in the, in the high altiplanos and then to come to lakefront with this blue color is, is phenomenal. Um, this is just 18 rooms, again, fully inclusive, all the meals, all the excursions are included here to get out and explore um, the surrounding villages and the different ethnic groups of the lake, um, the Uros Islands, etc. Um, so again, just those that maybe came in a bit late, I was talking about how Pukyo combines with Cerca and Arequipa and Titi Laka. So I'm just going to show this kind of sample itinerary again, talking about flying into Cerca, spending a couple nights in Arequipa at Cerca in order to acclimate and enjoy Arequipa, since that's around seven and a half thousand feet, doing the three hour drive to get into the Colca Canyon to Pukyo. And then if you're going to continue on to Lake Titicaca, you can do that six hour drive to finish there. Um, again, alternatives, if you don't want to do the whole cross trip, you can come into Arequipa, go to Pukyo, and then come back to Arequipa and then fly out of there. You have that, the train option. If people are going from Cusco to Lake Titicaca and then taking the train from Lake Titicaca to Arequipa, they can get off at 1130 in the morning that day. And it's only an hour and a half drive down into the Colca if you're getting off the Andean Explorer train. And this just kind of shows that it's kind of then the shortest you would do it. it would be like a seven day, six night itinerary, which is two nights, two nights, two nights at the properties there. Um, and that's it. So I'm going to leave that up. If you want to go see the website at Pukio or kind of go Andean travel, we have a travel professional site there, which you can sign up for to get, you know, access to images and fact sheets and rates. You know, those are also available on my website. I have the Pukio page live there. I'm going to send an email to everybody following up with all of our current marketing materials, um, images. I'm going to send some social media reels. So if you want, please download those. And it would really, we really appreciate it if you can share those on social media and tag it. I'm um, just to, you know, show to your clients, this is something new and cool in Peru. And 
let me just see what other places. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, as far as guiding in Arequipa, yeah, actually staying in at Cerca, the rates do include excursions as well. So we do have our own guides for doing city tours, going out to see the CR quarries. Um, all of that stuff is actually included in the rates at, at Cerca as well. So that can be taken care of. And then Pat, I think I answered this, and you can take the train from Lake Titicaca to Machu Picchu. No, you can take the train from Lake Titicaca to Cusco and then be in Cusco and then take a different train that gets to Machu Picchu. I mean, I guess it is kind of the same tracks, but yeah. Hope Smith, best time to go. So, I mean, same thing. It kind of got the same weather patterns as the rest of Peru. So like the, I would say the high season, which is the, the dry season, which is the middle of the winter, it would be June, July, August. Shoulder seasons, March, April, May would be uh, kind of end of the rainy season. Um, a little bit of rain, but things are going to be very lush and green. Plenty of crops in the field. And then if we're looking at the other shoulder season on the other side, September, October, November. And then we would say December, January, February is a rainy season. I was just there in December um, in the rainy season. And it's a lot warmer than it is in June or July because you're there in the summer. And, you know, this is the age old thing. People are always like, oh, I don't want to go in the rainy season. The rainy season is awesome when you go up in the Andes. Like we, the days when I was at Pukyo, pretty much every day starts off crystal clear, beautiful, sunny go off and do your excursions, do a hike, explore, come back for lunch. And then in the afternoon, you can kind of see the clouds building up. And then almost when I was there over three day, three, four days, every day around two, 3 PM, like this incredible thunder, thunder and lightning storm would happen. And I would sit under my terrace on the tent and just watch the heavens open and hear thunder and lightning. I don't get that in California, you know, that hope. So it was just super cool to sit there and watch the heavens. And then that would go away and there would be rainbows and everything's fresh. So like I wouldn't definitely wouldn't say to not go during the rainy season either. And the other thing that's interesting too is that, you know, people always concentrate in this June, July, August time period. It's kind of the driest time of the year. And actually when I talked about all the folklore and the, the dances and traditions there, most of those festivals actually happen in the rainy season in their summertime because that's their, you know, when the crops are lush into the harvest season. So if you want to catch like really cool festivals, you actually want to go during the rainy season. Um, that's when the people there are celebrating the most. And I think that the valley is the most beautiful because it's full of crops. Um, oh, hey, Renata. <laughs> um, okay, y'all, that's it. So thanks for joining me. I hope you're excited about this and I'm sure I missed some stuff, but again, just drop me an email. Um, you can book this through any of your DMCs if you want. Um, you can book it direct. You can work with Peru Empire, however you want to do it. We'd be happy to have you. And I will say that in the last months we have been, I mean, Lorenzo and his dad Ignacio are super generous people. We've had the salespeople from all of the DMCs in Peru there lately. I see all of the feedback forums in the last couple of months. It's been nothing but fam trips from people in the industry. We want people to come here. We want people to experience it. So I guarantee that your DMCs have been, if you, you know, whoever you work with, they've been there already and have been experiencing it. So we're ready to, to sell it as well. All right. I'll leave this up. If there's anything else, gracias, hope. Um, 